think... Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! things change the more they stay the same it really does seem to be true at the moment as we survey the landscape of apparently chaotic domestic and international politics and recognize that in fact there is nothing new under the sun the idea that uh, politicians and indeed voters can be completely blind to the appliance of science nothing new about that just ask Galileo I suppose would be one of the most obvious examples of that spending his whole life under house arrest for proving effectively that uh, that the earth revolved around the sun and not the other way around but I uh, want to start with climate change this morning it seems to me it seems to me, and I, I don't want to, because we're all amateurs, the, the professionals are pretty much in unanimous agreement on it, so there's no point in us who don't really understand the issues and have either followed on from the scientists or got our comments from under the, under the line on the Daily Mail website. That, that's an argument that you can listen to on other radio programmes, all right? On this one, I, I want to try and take a step back from the issue. Uh, it, it, it is probably going to be the case that the uh, decision by Donald Trump to pull out of the Paris climate change accord does not have quite the ramifications that a lot of um, understandably scared and, and, and upset and infuriated people today think it will. The time scale is pertinent. Um, the possibility that he won't be in the job for the whole duration of his term or that he won't win the next one, all of these will impact upon just how profound a withdrawal it proves to be. And the, um, I, I guess the other side of that argument then, also becomes the, the simple march of history, which suggests that by the time anything meaningful happens on this front with fossil fuels, they'll cost a hell of a lot more to employ to provide energy than renewables will anyway. Or with fracking, of course, being so popular now uh, in parts of America, the natural gas that's being yielded via that process, although still very controversial, will be considerably cheaper than anything you can dig out of the ground or anything that you can combust in ways that would fly in the face of the... Uh, of the of the Paris Accord, so we're not going to indulge in an argument about um, things that you and I don't really understand. Uh, I am going to acknowledge that when humanity doesn't really understand stuff, it's left with two choices: listen to the people who do understand it, or listen to the snake oil salesmen and scaremongers. We live in an era now for a variety of reasons where the snake oil salesmen and scaremongers are doing fantastic business and where, as Michael Go famously observed, a country can perhaps have enough of experts, even when those experts are scientists and even when I think over 95% of them are in broad agreement on whether or not there is a relationship between humankind's behaviour and the heating of the planet. So we'll park that. I was going to ask you about what links them, but oddly, um, since the light went on, I think I've worked it out. I was going to say, because you see it as an essentially right-wing position, whatever that means. I, I would describe it as the sort of fetishization of ignorance that's always been very popular in politics. And I don't, it sounds very insulting, I don't necessarily mean it as an insult. To be told quite late in life that everything you've always thought to be true isn't true is quite a hard pill to swallow, you know. Uh, you look at nicotine legislation, the adverts, the billboards that were put up around America and Britain not that long ago telling you that having a, having a cigarette every few minutes was actually good for your health, that, you know, a fag a day would keep the doctor away, that kind of thing. You look at that, it's hard for people to adjust uh, to that to that mindset. We won't even mention immigration and how hard it is for people not to be frightened of the unknown. Instead, we'll mention science. We'll mention the fact that when Galileo was alive, it wasn't just the church that, that was infuriated by his scientific proof of heliocentrism. It was an awful lot of the congregations as well to be told that the earth is not the center of the universe undermined awful, I mean, it undermined the, the primacy of humanity. It undermined Christianity. It undermined religion. It was true but it was too true for people to readily accept. It was too frightening for people to accept. So, oddly, when I um, was going to ask you what, what unites these mindsets, these worldviews that, that sort of reject 
uh, evidence that reject facts what, what is it that, that explains why people are determined to believe things that aren't true if they provide comfort whether it's about the European Union or about immigration or about climate change or about what are the other sort of classics on that list I, I, sexuality people have a massive problem accepting that that sexuality is innate they insist on believing that it isn't and and it's just change isn't it it's just a resistance to change that's all it is. It doesn't make you a bad person, necessarily. It depends how heavy that resistance to change is. Uh, it depends, of course, how determined you are to impose your wrongness upon people who aren't resistant to change or people who are part of change. But when you look for, for, for things that unite all of these weird worldviews that are popular despite being easily disproved, and, of course, as regular listeners to this programme will know, when you absolutely and definitively disprove somebody's belief in, in immigration myths or European Union myths or climate change myths or whatever it may be, they don't go away with the uh, scales having fallen from their eyes. They go away absolutely convinced, even more than ever, that they're right and that you have manipulated them or talked over them or interrupted them or, or, or cheated or lied or exaggerated. So you pull down someone's pants, show the whole world their bottom, and they will go away absolutely convinced that their trousers never even dipped an inch. I don't know why, but I think the best I've got is resistance to change. So the idea is, I know, but even then, you know, it's the passion that I struggle with. It's the, oh, the existence of God, I suppose, would be an even better example, but there's no, Michael's just uh, piled in with that, but there's no scientific uh, analogy to be drawn there. No one's ever going to be able to scientifically prove or disprove the existence of God. And everybody gets overtaken, of course. Science is only the best available explanation for all of the observable evidence. It's never, fa it's never infallible. Um, I, I, I think Galileo's theory of the universe is close to infallible because it was backed up with his telescope. He was actually showing you pictures of stuff. But Einstein's theory of relativity has already been superseded, not because it was wrong, but because as more evidence becomes available, the best available explanation for all of the available evidence could perhaps shift. It could evolve. Darwin's theory of evolution is not where geneticists are now, but it was very much an important step on the path to where geneticists are now. So what's changing? Well, why? It's the strength of opposition. Donald Trump stands up and says, we're going to get American jobs back, or we're going to make America great again, we're going to put America workers first. You can get your head around all of that, right? That's as old as the hills, that kind of bovine appeal to, to, to fatuous faux patriotism. But here's the thing. When he said that climate change is a hoax perpetrated by China, perpetrated by China, it, it was so out there, bonkers, that I did stop and think, I wonder whether that's the moment where his prediction that he could shoot someone dead on Fifth Avenue and none of his fans would care because they're so stupid and blinkered and bigoted. He didn't add that, but that's obviously what he meant. I could shoot someone dead on Fifth Avenue and none of my fans would care, brackets, because they're so stupid and blinkered and bigoted. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It's like incredible. <laughs> I wondered whether the China comment, but just, just because it's so obviously wrong, A, how the hell would China be able to persuade over 90% of the world's scientists to all agree, or, or scientists working in the relevant field, to all agree on something? How would they do that? How, how would they do that? You know, hello, it's China here. Uh, I appreciate that you're a very well-qualified scientist and you currently remain convinced that uh, climate change has absolutely no anthropocentric explanation whatsoever. Here's a load of yen. Here's a, here's a, load, of, here's a load of moolah. Here, would you like a car? And would you mind uh, claiming that climate change is real and does threaten the planet? Check, please. It's so absolutely out. It's a China. China perpetrated a hoax about climate change. And that this weird rump of support, the kind of Fox News worldview made flesh just buys it anything he says i could shoot someone on fifth avenue my fans wouldn't care because they're so stupid they are so dumb i have the dumbest fans the dumbest the absolute i could tell them i could tell these people that china had perpetrated climate change as a hoax designed to i don't know help it make more rubber dinghies and this lot would swallow it this fox news fed uh herd of halfwits would would swallow it and they do it is day 96 of the Trump presidency, and it's time for part three of our Trump voter panel. 
During the campaign and since President Trump took office, I've sat down with a group of diehard Trump voters to gauge their feelings on his progress. So how do they feel now about some of his shifting positions? As usual, they have strong opinions. I do want to get all of your takes on what some call flip-flop, some call a 180-degree turn. Listen to this. I said, here's the problem with NATO. It's obsolete. I said it was obsolete. It's no longer obsolete. We're going to have a great relationship with Putin and Russia. Right now, we're not getting along with Russia at all. We may be at an all-time low in terms of uh, relationship with Russia. How do you feel Look about Look at the this? dates there. Mm -hmm. The dates are a year apart. The dates reflect a time when he was not the president, when he was not privy to some of the materials he'd be provided as the president, some of the uh, the uh, confidential secret materials. Sure, but I mean, does he need a confidential secret material to know that NATO is relevant? Well, he had a change of opinion. He changed his mind. And you're comfortable all, with that? I am comfortable with that because I feel that we're all entitled to change with circumstances, with timing. It's foolish to, to hold on to a... This particular view and then be shown evidence for something else. But you're comfortable that he now believes in working with NATO, that he now believes in getting involved if need be in Syria, that he now no longer believes that China is a currency manipulator. You're comfortable with his changes of position. I'm, I'm satisfied with them. I believe that, uh, that everything's fluid and you can't make an informed decision if you don't have the proper information did you feel that he was not informed during the campaign i think he was as informed as they could get could they could make him yeah. he wasn't so yeah we do have a partisan split in this country and democrats and republicans see things differently blah 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 but there's something a little bit special going on with trump voters and i think this is where it starts to get really hairy because all right look at look at this this is uh, a snapshot of real life. See that blue line there? It's faint, but you see that blue line there? That's real life. That is the performance of the stock market under Barack Obama as president. This is the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Uh, when he took office, the Dow was at just under 8,000 points. Today, it closed at 19,615 points. So the stock market since barack obama has been president has risen by almost 12,000 points it is considerably more than doubled since he's been president but if you ask donald trump voters about this 39 percent of donald trump voters say that the stock market has dropped since barack obama has been in office which is crazy it's way more than doubled you guys think it's dropped the stock market Here's another one that's even more astonishing. This is, again, uh, this will start with the snapshot of real life. Uh, this is the unemployment rate over the time that Barack Obama has been in office as president. And unemployment, you know, it always flops around a little bit. It always has little seasonal zigzags. But this is a very clear picture. There's only one way to describe what has happened overall to unemployment in America since Barack Obama has been president. And if you ask America about that, America knows this is what has happened to unemployment under Barack Obama. If you, in this new national poll, if you ask Hillary Clinton voters, they understand this. Unemployment rates under President Obama have dropped. You ask Gary Johnson voters, they understand this. Unemployment rates under Barack Obama have dropped. You ask Jill Stein voters, they get it. You ask people who voted for someone other than Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, Jill Stein, or Gary Johnson. So like people who voted for, for Vermin Supreme. You ask people who voted for other, even they freaking know this. Everybody knows that unemployment has dropped under Barack Obama, but not Donald Trump voters. And not by a mile, look at that, by a 47 point margin. Donald Trump voters look at that graph on the right and say, hmm, yes, unemployment has gone up under President Obama. By a 47 point margin. The whole rest of the country gets it, but look at that among Trump voters. That's insane, that is plainly wrong. And it's, this is not even one of those things that is widely misunderstood among the American people and Trump voters just happen to be a little more confused about it than other people. No, everybody gets this. But Trump voters don't, by a huge margin. They're in a fantasy world about this. They do not know what is true when you ask them about this issue, even though the rest of the country does know what's true. And that's, that's what I think is actually really important and really interesting about this poll. And I know it's a poll after an election, but I feel like... 
This is an important bit of data. It's not predicting any election result here, right? There's no reason to go to the bank on this in terms of who's going to win something of any kind. But just take a peek into the mind of, of Trump voters, of Trump voters nationwide. From this new data that we've got exclusively tonight, 40% of Trump voters believe that Donald Trump won the popular vote. Donald Trump did not win the popular vote. Um, Donald Trump voters, by a huge margin, 60% of them, believe that millions of people voted illegally for Hillary Clinton in the presidential election. Millions of people did not vote illegally for Hillary Clinton in the presidential election. Donald Trump voters, by a huge margin, huge margin, 73 to 6, Donald Trump voters believe that George Soros is paying people to protest against Donald Trump. George Soros is not paying people to protest against Donald Trump. But 73% of Trump voters believe that he is, and only 6% say that is not true. And again, let me reiterate, that is not true. He is not paying people to protest against Trump. But among Trump supporters, it is an absolute article of faith. Here's a weird one. Uh, nearly a third of Donald Trump voters, 29% of Donald Trump voters, say they do not think that votes from the state of California should be included in the national popular vote. What's that about? I mean, I mean the logical follow-up to that is asking Trump voters whether or not they think California should be forced out of the country, <laughs> right? I mean, or are they saying that California should stay in the country, it should still be seen as part of the United States of America, but maybe California still just shouldn't have its votes counted? I mean, honestly, you shouldn't count California's votes as part of the national vote total? I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe that is what they want. This is strange stuff. But again, this is exclusive to us. PPP is going to release this national poll tomorrow. We got this exclusive first look at it tonight. And I think it, it shows that even after the election, what Trump voters believe about the world is distinctively different from what the rest of the country believes and from what is true. And this, this alternate reality that they're in, it is weird enough and specific enough that you can't say it just springs from broader misunderstandings or from you know, a broader ignorance on the issues that afflicts the country. I mean, this is a specific alternate reality that was created by the Trump movement for a political purpose. And it worked for that political purpose. And so now, as the Trump administration takes shape, they have to know that they're in power thanks to their voter base that has these false beliefs about the country. Some of the saddest stuff I've read recently, so I'm covering a lot of ground. You can ring in now and sort of cut me off in my prime or just book your place first up after the travel news. Question very simply is um, uh, uh, what, what the appetite the, the appetite to reject science. That's what I'm trying to get underneath. That's what I'm trying to find out. 0345 Where do you think it comes from? Where do you think the... Uh, where do you think the desire comes from? It's just the one thing I can't get. I, I, if I don't understand stuff, I find people who know more than I do, right? That just seems to me to be natural. If I don't understand stuff, I find people who know more than I do, and I see what they've got to say. The climate change debate seems to have been conducted between people who know loads and loads and loads about it, and then a couple of sort of retired politicians, a couple of bloggers who can't earn a decent living doing proper journalism, so find this weird little niche to write about. As if Boris Johnson had spent his whole life writing blogs about bananas, instead of going off to be Foreign Secretary or Edit the Spectator or actually get proper jobs in journalism. I hold no torch for Boris Johnson, but he did not spend his whole life writing blogs about bananas and Brussels. If he had had, that that would be the equivalent of where a lot of the climate change skepticism comes from. I want to get inside that mindset. But here's the weirdest thing. Um, when Roger Ailes lost his job at Fox News in America and subsequently passed away, some of the stuff that was written by youngish Americans, 20s, 30s, even 40s, about the damage that he'd inflicted upon their families was absolutely heartbreaking. Because people, uh, a little undereducated, perhaps a little um, older in, in, in uh, age terms, would watch this television channel all day and be convinced that one of the most poignant things was, I, I went, after my grandfather died, I realised that he'd hidden all his guns and jewellery 
around the house because he had been persuaded by Fox News that Barack Obama was personally going to come to his house and steal it. These tales of families that have been torn apart because the older generation just regurgitate these appalling lies, these appalling exaggerations and embellishments, uh, usually about the usual suspects, usually about immigration, often about climate change, they'd argue about as well. And, and people were burying their parents and their grandparents without ever having rediscovered the common ground of their childhood, without ever having rebuilt the bonds that were broken by political argument informed by lies told by pseudo-journalistic organizations like Fox. And of course it's got much worse in America with Infowars and Breitbart, these sites that, that look like journalism but, um, but aren't by any recognizable definition of the term. I'm animated. I'm alive. My heart's big. It's got hot blood going through it fast. I like to fight too. I like to eat. I like to have children. I'm here. I got a life force. This is a human. This is what we look like. This is what we act like. This is what everybody was like before us. This is what I am. The reason there's so many gay people now is because it's a chemical warfare operation. Here's the inside of this juice box. And if, you, and if they zoom in any more, see that thin plastic? It's got it. After you're done drinking your little juices, well, you, I mean, you're, you're, you're ready to go out and have a baby. You're ready to put makeup on. You're ready to wear a short skirt. Alex is anti-gay. He's saying the chemicals are making people gay. Folks, it's making the frogs gay. Two-thirds of the frogs down in Houston are bisexual. Every major Western country heavily involved in 9-11. It took me about a year with Sandy Hook to come to grips with the fact that the whole thing was fake. The attacks in Orlando were a false flag terror attack. Sometimes I hear my show and it sounds like the most powerful talk radio I've ever heard. Other times it sounds like a monkey doing you know what with a football. So I, I'm probably wasting my time, but I don't, I don't get the entry level on this. It, it, I, but let's use me, okay, as the whipping boy. So you can use me as the idiot, the, the, the example of everything that's wrong. If I don't understand something, I go to really clever people who seem to. They're not infallible. Okay, they're not perfect. They're not um, by any stretch of the imagination uh, uh, going to be right about everything. But the more they've studied, perhaps I'm old fashioned by this. The more they've studied, the more they've uh, worked, researched, conducted experiments, the more that they've focused on their work, their field, the more faith I have in them. Right. I don't understand the opposite mindset to that. I just don't. And sometimes you find two people brilliantly qualified who passionately disagree, but not really on this issue. On this one issue, you, you might find a couple of kind of rogue scientists who are in the pay of the fossil fuel lobby, but you won't, you won't find proper balance, if you will, because there isn't any. It would be a bit like saying, and coming up next on the program, someone will explain why Galileo is wrong. And in fact, the sun does revolve around the Earth and not the other way around, despite the evidence that you can see out of your telescope currently in your front window. That, that's what I want to try and understand. What do you think? And I don't know that... Oh, this is going to sound awful, but if you are one of the people that I'm describing and criticising, I'm not sure you'll be able to explain to me what's going on. It, it, you know, can you explain to me why you choose to believe commenters on the Daily Mail website more than you would believe the, the best qualified climate scientists on the planet? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. It's messy, this, but it's important, and I really like to get a handle on it. And I don't. Uh, sorry, again, it's going to sound desperately ungrateful. I don't want to have a conversation about the nuances of the pa pa Paris Climate Change Agreement. I know that it's not binding. I know that it's a lot more complicated than some of the commentary allows. And I know that some environmentalists were, were, were concerned that it didn't go far enough. The Nicaraguan example would be the best on that. But that's not what I'm asking you today. There is no way Donald Trump has pulled out of the Paris Climate Change Agreement because he has a profoundly sophisticated understanding of its potential flaws and failure to go far enough in certain areas of environmental policing. He's pulled out of it because thick people love it. That's pretty much his, his success in a nutshell. He's pulled out of this agreement because people who really don't understand but have somehow been persuaded that it is their enemy will cheer it. I will, I will feast on your liberal tears, they'll be saying, once I've stopped 
coughing up huge gobs of phlegm and rushing to the chemists to renew my children's inhaler prescriptions while actually I say rushing to the chemists I'll probably have to take the dinghy it's 10 17. just sticking with science and experts for a moment uh, I suppose this would be filed under psychology would it the Dunning-Kruger effect in a nutshell, um, or, or the backfire effect, as a rule, misinformed people do not change their minds once they have been presented with facts that challenge their beliefs. But beyond simply not changing their minds when they should, research shows that they are likely to become more attached to their ma mistaken beliefs. The factual information backfires, which has uh, provided me with a very good living, but doesn't exactly fill one with great confidence for the future. There's a phenomenon called the Dunning-Kruger effect. In controlled experiments, psychologists found that the lower a person's ability is at something, the more likely they are to overestimate that skill. People who performed the poorest at driving, or at playing chess, or at a number of other skills, were most likely to rate themselves as excellent drivers or chess players, before or even after their skills were tested. Where else have we seen this in action? Over and over again, we've seen white Americans declaring, I am not a racist, despite clearly being racist. Therefore, when Donald Trump says, I am the least racist person that you have ever met. That should be a clue that he is, in fact, racist. I have a great relationship with the blacks. Are you Who's that, the Indian? Your man, the Indian? He's a Mexican. This makes sense. If a person has a crude understanding of racism in America... Did they call you something pertaining to your race? Maybe they think it only refers to this or this or this. Naturally, they'll believe that it doesn't apply to them. They don't necessarily hate other ethnic groups. They're just clueless to the subtleties of what racism can look like. They're thugs and they're agitators. So, the next time someone declares, I'm not a racist. I am not racist, okay? No, I'm not a racist. I am the least racist person. Well, they might as well be telling you, Stay out of America. Not every black person is a piece of shit. If I say Negro, or black boy, or uh, uh, a slave. If I were starting off today, I would love to be a well-educated black, because I really believe they do have an actual advantage. What do we do with BET, Black mm -hmm. Entertainment, right? The whites don't get any nominations. Who, Pocahontas? <laughs> it's Pocahontas. Pocahontas. Go back to Univision. They're rapists. These are people only believe in GI. Oh, look at my African-American over here. That's the Dunning-Kruger Trump effect. So when you prove to people that they're wrong, it goes viral on the... No, when you prove to people that they're wrong, they go away even more convinced that they're right. And that's what I want to talk about in the context of climate change today. What, what do you think explains the decision of a bus driver to believe, or, or, a, or an accountant or a radio presenter, to believe that he understands climate science better than a climate scientist? I just want to try and get inside that. I don't want to have an argument about any of the other elements. Just that psychological process described there as the backfire effect. Katie's in Whitney. Katie, what would you like to say? I, uh, I think this is almost like a religion. Yes. Um, People look at it and it's like, well, I have a choice as to whether I believe this or not. And I'm not really sure. I don't really understand all this modelling stuff about how the Earth's warmed up. And it's probably just a trend now. I don't believe it. it it's, it's insane. But, what, but, but, but then you line up all of the other people. And at least with religion, you know, I, I quite like the idea of going to heaven. So I think I will choose to believe in that, even if there are some very difficult obstacles to get over to sustain that belief. The idea of eternal paradise is that's quite, that's quite, quite a draw. That's quite a big carrot. So I, yeah. I can get that. Where's the carrot here? But there isn't. No, it's not the carrot. It's the stick. It's the thought of going to hell or having to get rid of your gas guzzling car and change the way. Or you pay. Mo they want to take our money away because they are they 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 they're them. They are them. They 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 and they want my money and and they're just coming up with lies to get more money off me. Exactly, and I'll have to drive a Prius instead of a, you know, a, a Jeep or something. Do you know what I mean? It's that I think so, but it's not, I want more, I want more. But you, I get this all the time, so I work in vaccines, and it's the same thing with anti-vaxxers. The more evidence you give them, the more t you tell them how many people's lives have been saved by vaccines and how the risks are far outweighed by the benefits. People just get more and more entrenched. It's the same kind of phenomenon. And you're absolutely right. You, the more facts you give people, the more entrenched they get in their positions. It's so know. bizarre. You know, you're the second person to tell me that. This is coming from a, a tweet called social, a Twitter called Social Commentary. One of the most difficult conversations I have is with people who do not believe in medicine. They feel it's all a con. How can you not believe in medicine, though? 
Uh, they, hang on, I'm asking the questions. Sorry. That's all right. But that's, so, so you'd put that on the list. Vaccines were actually bubbling away in the back of my brain. You've just pulled them to the forefront. Medicine, vaccines. What else do we put on this? I suppose we'd put heliocentrism there, wouldn't you, going back far enough? And that was intrinsically linked to religion. The idea that Galileo showed them that the, uh, that the Earth revolved around the sun and they locked him up for the rest of his life. That, that, that's the depth of belief because their religion was threatened. What's threatened by... What's threatened by climate change denial? I think it kind of makes people feel stupid, though, and it's it's because people are sort of a bit intimidated by science and a bit scared of science, and they think that anybody who does science is a bit of a nerd. Whereas I think if people generally in society had a higher level of understanding about science and could actually penetrate the sort of science a little bit more themselves and understand it a little bit more themselves, they'd probably be a bit less intimidated. And journalism as well plays a part in this. If, if journalists are the bridge between the experts and the and the non-experts, which I think in many areas we should be, then we'd have spent a lot of time educating and informing the public about the threat posed by climate change instead of um, doing the ghost train, selling tickets for the ghost train, like we usually do, which is they're all trying to nick your money off you. It's a hoax perpetrated by China. The yeah. bendy bananas of science, then, climate change. Indeed, exactly. Katie, thank you. 25 minutes after 10 is the time. Um, a helpful contribution. The parallel with, with anti-vaxxers is great. The problem is, of course, that anyone listening to this going, no, how dare you? Vaccines are evil. Big Pharma is trying to kill us all. You're not really going to be able to be able to explain to me why people choose to be so stupid because you don't think you're stupid uh, that's kind of the problem that we've set ourselves this morning but as problems go it's all right john's in working john what's going on hi james Hello, john. where to start with this one <laughs> take, um, take your time I mean, okay um i think we're in a particularly strange historical period um it seems to be a combination of intellectual decline and moral decline i think the two things are connected yes as we've become more individualized in a sort of a thatcherite sense our connection not only to each other but also to our relationship to forms of knowledge to study the idea that you have to maybe put some effort into a expertise Expertise, yeah. Do you know, Mike, I, I, I mention him a lot, and, I, and I, I'm going to carry on doing so for as long as I live, but my, before, before I lost my dad a few years ago, he, he, you know what was making him cross? And we were coming from very different places politically by, by, by then in his life, but what used to make him cross was the demonization of the word elite. Now, I, I know sometimes the unearned elite is, is something that you should be targeting, but the idea that elitism in terms of effort, expertise, knowledge, learning, he liked elites. He thinks elites should really be the people you go to, the elite scientists. It used to mean the best, and we've managed to cheapen yes. that word. That's part of what you describe, Absolutely. I think. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and the funny thing is, is that I, I've been described as being part of the liberal elite, and yet I, I'm, I'm, I earn just a little bit more than the national minimum wage. It's kind of strange, really. No, it just it? means you're not a racist, John. That's all it means. <laughs> Well, it means that I read books. And no, no, not even that. You're over, you're over complicating it. The liberal elite, it just means you're not a racist. That's all it means. Well, well possibly, but I think we are in the age of the idiot. I think that needs to be said. Uh, and you're quite right what you say about uh, people not responding to rational persuasion. Um, I, that's been my experience. But why would you if choose people... it? What makes people choose it? So, you know, here, here is 97%, here is say, of, of the scientific research-based peer-reviewed work. It's not perfect. Science never is. We could discover something like dark matter or some other currently unknowable uh, phenomenon that changes our understanding of everything else. So, But here is the, the received wisdom on science, yeah? And here is... You know, Bertie Blogger. I'm going to choose Bertie Blogger on this one. Why? That's yeah. what I want to get to. Why would you choose? Why would you reject science? Because we can choose our own reality now, can't we? Uh, we can choose our own genders. We can choose what we believe. It's that everything has been dumbed down to such a level that you don't even have to. Be I don't know that I'd necessarily bring. I don't know that I'd necessarily bring gender into it, but I think well, I. I'll just throw that in as an example. No, I think I think I think I think I understand why you have it. it, it, it it's. Mm. I mean, oddly, that's probably scientifically more confusing than the climate change yeah, issue absolutely. is. But but yeah. in t it is. And then you've got, and then that's why Katie was strong with the vaccine stuff. Why, why, why do you want to believe that all doctors are wrong and that, that some some bloke is right? Well, because I just because I do and I can. And yes. who are you to tell me that I can't believe whatever I want to believe? A lack of responsibility, James. We have a lack of re personal responsibility now. We completely lost it. Everything seems to be falling apart, and not, all the sort of rational elements which hold the world together, say morally, intellectually, 
are in a tailspin. And the country, the people of this country, John, have had enough of experts. Let us never forget that. 29 minutes after 10 is the time. I enjoy these sort of conversations. If, 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 if you don't, feel free to attempt to redirect them. 0345 6060973. I like you, James, says Jim in Castleford. I listen to you every day, and I know you're taking the mickey, but please stop saying China like that. I can't. It's, it's, it's become like a verbal tick, China. I can't say it in any other way. Seriously, I, my local um, Chinese restaurant has the word China in the title, and I can't even not say it there. It's just Donald Trump has washed my brain. Luckily, all he's done to me is make me say China in a silly way. What he's done to a significant swathe of America is encourage them to vote for the essential um, pollution of the planet. It's half past ten. It's the comforting nature of untruths that I'm trying to unpin today. And uh, it's, a, it's a slightly unfair exercise because, of course, if you are comforted by things that aren't true, you will argue furiously that they are true. And there's not much room for you in today's discussion because we're trying to work out why people like you are so effectively and successfully misled. Um, uh, vaccines would be on the list. Heliocentrism would be on the list. The refusal to believe that the Earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around. It took centuries for people to accept that. The flat Earth society is still, I wouldn't say going strong, but it's still going. People who refuse to believe that the planet is round, uh, even though you know we have now been to space and taken pictures of it. That these these comforting beliefs now go back to when religion ruled the roost, as it still does in other parts of the world, but doesn't really in this part of the world, certainly not in the context of British democracy. It was easy to understand why people voted for things that were bad for them. Because because this is why Marx called religion the opiate of the people. Because the belief that you're going to get your reward in the next life and that somehow suffering in this life was a good thing to do, a noble thing to do. That's brilliant for the people causing the suffering. That's brilliant for the mill owners and the master sweeps. That's absolutely fantastic for the industrialists who kind of will just stop paying you if your leg gets chopped off at work. That's superb because you're going to get your reward in the next world. So it was, a, for Marx at least, it was an obstacle to proper revolution. Is that the people are never going to rise up against their oppressors because they're going to be living in heaven when they die. That's what I, that's what I think he meant. I mean, crikey, feel free to pull that apart. That's sort of... Uh, kindergarten analysis of Das Kapital, but the, 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 for me that's what opiate to the people means. You're not going to demand justice in this world because you're going to get loads of it in the next world. And who really loves that? Actually, it shouldn't be the people who are losing in this world. It should be the people who are winning. But how often do I ask you why people can be so easily persuaded to vote against their own interests? The answer is because the people doing the persuading have all the money and the power. Maybe that's relevant to climate change. So if you've bought into the idea that a Tim Pot blogger and a couple of retired cabinet ministers understand climate science better than almost every cli climate scientist on the planet, what do you get out of it? That, that Maybe you could tell me that. Not, not how did you get into such a weird worldview, but what do you get out of it? How does it make you feel good to go, ha-ha, yeah, down with environmentally friendly policies? Hey, down with clean air. Down with wind power when we could be burning lots of coal. Yay, winning, I will, I will drink your liberal tears. Ha, ha, ha. That, I don't get it. You know, I don't, I mean, the, the Brexit parallel is pretty clear as well. People go, yeah, ha, 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 yeah, you suck it up, listen to you, still moaning. <laughs> yeah, I'm moaning about the fact that you're going to be poorer. <laughs> yeah, you hate the fact that I'm going to be poorer, don't you? You libtard loser. You hate the fact that my children aren't going to enjoy the freedoms that I enjoy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I love your liberal tears. You just can't stand the fact that I am going to be demonstrably poorer next year than I am now, can you? No, I can't. I hate it. And you voted for it. And you hate me for pointing it out. So what do you get out of climate change? Denial. Where, where, where's the payoff? Where's the bonus? Where's the jackpot? Matt's in Lewisham. Matt, what's going on? Hi, James. Hello. Good morning. Um, on the face of it, this is so utterly depressing. I actually just wanted to turn the radio off when you started this. Um, it's a common reaction. It's a common reaction. The challenge I face every morning is to overcome that initial, that initial impulse, Matt, and keep, and keep you close. <laughs> It's the absolute crystallization of, of, of Gove's comment, I think we've all had enough of experts. And your last caller put it so succinctly, the, the anti-academic, the anti-scientific, the anti-political, the anti-banker has all been rolled into one. And people's desire to kick back is far greater than anything else. So they will, people will commit these acts of self-harm if they feel 
that they're getting one over, one back. And I think it... Oh, you know, that's the kicker. That's the payoff. The, ha-ha, you, you see, yeah. I, might have, I might have left school at 15 with no O-levels, but um, on this one, at least, you with your six degrees, how my opinion counts for just as much as yours does. And also, James, but I think it, it, it does take a little bit, there's almost a little bit more sympathy to, to be had here if you look at it a bit more deeply, because if you've got zero wage growth, you're on a zero hours contract, your life is, you, you're poorer than your parents, you can never afford a house. It's very easy to make that leap to think, hang on, all of these people, all of these people who go to Davos, all of these yeah. people who do this, who do that, they're all in it together. And now it's not long before you come up with the Illuminati, but before that, you <laughs> it's can- on the, It's on the same road, actually. You can look at that and you think, actually, these people have affected my life. These people have caused me to have zero hours contract, zero inflation, be poorer than my parents. And so, you know what? I am going to kick them. And you know what? The blogger, he looks more like me. He sounds more like me than those people do. Or he tries to. He pretends to be more like me because it's usually quite well-educated people who probably know that they're spinning a line, but they're getting quite a nice little career out of it, whether it is, you know, whether they're talking about Muslims or immigrants or climate change. It, it, they're, they're appealing to people less educated than them, usually. Yeah, yeah. And, and there was a high point. 1989, if you remember the... I mean, I'm a, I'm a real geek here, but the European elections, I think, in 1989, the Green Party in this country polled very, very well. Mm. And there was a moment, there was a moment where we thought that climate change or global warming, as it was referred to then, uh, was, was going to be addressed. But, but it, is, it is sort of being addressed by Paris, but not on the scale that, that, that you're right. Some people thought it was back then. All right, I'll, I'll go geek here. Actually, no, I'll go conspiracy. I'll go tinfoil hat. You've gone geek. I, I, I Because you, you, the people you describe are, are being badly treated and are being, to a degree, oppressed. And, and you're right, the experts turning up at Davos should have done more to protect them. But to protect them from whom? Our answer, to protect them from secretive, extremely wealthy people who genuinely do control the mass media and who generally do attempt to protect their own position by making people blame um, completely the wrong target for, for their own plight. I think the, the Wall Street, the Occupy Wall Street was a moment. I think when the history of the 21st century gets written, that, that, that almost seems to me to be a pivot, when it just for a moment began to look as if that 99%, 1% paradigm was going to start defining a new generation of politics. The effort just went in hugely on trying to revert it to not 99%, 1%, but, you know, native-born or America or Britain rather than human rather than 99 percent one percent let's go nativist again let's get immigration back at the top of the conversational agenda now that, that's my pet theory at the moment and do you think that's gone forever can't be can it because because human beings essentially are decent and eventually you realize that that old imran over there has got a hell of a lot more in common with you than the person who's telling you that imran wants to kill you because climate change is an interesting one, because actually if you, if you, if you drive an electric car, it's going to save you money. If you have solar panels on your house, it saves you money. There are yeah. so many reasons to, to, to act in these ways. There are so many reasons to be nudged in this way. But as I say, people's mistrust, people's desire to kick the experts is greater than anything else. And they will, cut, they will keep, people will keep committing these acts of self-harm if they feel they're kicking yeah. the experts. Yeah, I'm not, I, 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 and the oil companies and the mining companies are probably far more uh, evil. Well, I mean, who, who, who is doing more harm to your child? The person blows smoke in their face or the person telling the, the fellow blows smoke in their face to stop? 10.41 is the time. I'll blow smoke in my child's face if I want to, you do-gooding liberal, you muesli-munching, sandal-wearing loser. If I want to blow smoke, how dare you ban me from smoking cigarettes? Has anyone, Matt, before you go, you, you clearly know more, has anyone ever argued that, that the science on smoking is wrong? Uh, well, I've never met them, no. um, but then as you always say, just because uh, I've never met them doesn't mean that they're not out there. Doesn't mean they don't exist. It'll be out there. That'll be the sort of next stage of this kind of bovine world view. Be, I, I, so the science on smoking is wrong. I think the scientists have got that wrong as well. Chris is in Gerard's Cross. Chris, what would you like to say? Oh, good morning, James. Hello, Chris. Um, yeah, again, to your point about uh, people not wanting to change their minds when presented with new evidence or new information. Yes. Uh, I think it's because the general pu public, does uh, anybody from the general public does not want to be seen to have made a mistake, not want to be seen to change their minds. Somehow, changing their minds, for whatever reason, is seen as being uh, a sign of weakness. 
that you've made a mistake the first time round. And yet that whole history of science is about changing your mind, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Um, but people don't want to be seen to be weak to have made the incorrect choice the first time round. And I think that your favourite subject, Brexit, is, is a perfect example of this. I mean, I was very, I, I was in favour of leaving the EU. Yes. So I voted Brexit because I was swayed by the 350 million. Sure. Um, 350, mate. Oh, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and since then, I've learned a lot more about it. The, the, the path to Brexit has become a lot more clear. It was very foggy in those days. Mm -hmm. I no, no idea really what was going to happen. It's still a bit foggy, but we have a, a better idea now of where we're going. And I've changed my mind. Yes. I'm now very much in favour of that we shouldn't resign. Because you're intelligent and honest, but you've also got this ability to acknowledge you were wrong. Which means, presumably, you weren't screaming from the rooftops that Brexit was brilliant and we need to get our country back. Presumably, as you've suggested, you were looking at slightly more plausible and nuanced arguments, which is an easier position to retreat from. If you were just waving flags and shouting slogans, it's harder to retreat, oddly, because you've invested more emotion and less intellect. That's exactly right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I wasn't being uh, ridiculously patriotic and saying that Britain is best and we only be good on our own, which I think is a, a, a rubbish argument. Uh, but I think the 350 million swayed me, and I, then I started looking at it in much more detail. That's a fact we emerged about the fact that we, we can't have the, the bits we want to keep, we can't keep, and we're now taking some of the bits that we don't want to keep. Um, so in that, as I've learned more and more and more, and the, the view has become clearer, as I say, the fog's disappeared. Yeah, 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 of course. Again, I've changed my mind, and I'm happy to tell people I've changed my mind, and several of my Brexit voting chums have all told me, oh, you, oh you're just weak, you're just... Snowflake. You haven't got the, haven't got the convictions, uh, courage of your convictions. Yes. Which is a horrible approach, really. If you can't change your mind in the light of new information, just imagine what the state of the human race would be in now. I mean, for example, if you and I had agreed, mm. um, say, two years ago, to go to a certain pub, we're going to go to this pub in this day. James and Chris got to have a few pints, nice pints of real ale, yeah. in this pub on a certain date in two years' time. Since that time, we've discovered that the road is horrible, uh, <laughs> it's overpriced. They only, serve, they only serve continental lager. We can't get a pint of old speckled hen, Chris. Exactly, James. We're not going there, but we've discovered at these facts, but we're not going to change our mind. No way. That would be weak. Let's go and drink weak lager, even though we don't like it, because that way we'll make Britain great again. Yeah, because we said we would two years ago. Even though we've got new information now that reveals that was not the optimal choice, we're still going to do it, even though we've now learnt new stuff. The pub's, the pub's fallen into a sinkhole, Chris. We'll buy a bloody ladder. <laughs> so anyway, that's what it is. People just don't want to seem to... Uh, uh, that's part of it, but we, d we haven't addressed how they got into the climate change denial position in the first place. Like that, that, that's the previous call. Actually, you work as a pair. You're like a tag team of callers. <laughs> so the previous caller was explaining the, the, the appeal of a false position, and Chris has pretty much nailed the difficulty of retreating or withdrawing from a false position. The tragedy is that those of us who can see what's going on, a bit like being up on the space shuttle, looking at the picture of the round Earth, reading the websites about how it's definitely still flat and it's a conspiracy to claim that the Earth is round, we have this awful sort of... Uh, paralyzed fear, you know, that old phrase that, that, that we've adapted on the program slightly. Those who do not learn from history are condemned forever to repeat it. Those who do learn from history are condemned forever to watch all the people who haven't learned from history repeat it. It's 10.46. Discussing the decision by Donald Trump to pull America out of the Paris Climate Change Agreement, uh, an agreement which it's almost, I think everyone could probably agree, he won't understand, he won't know what it's about. People have tried to explain to him. His daughter apparently has been desperately begging him not to do it, but, um, but of course it, it, it's what very rich, um, slightly shady billionaires have been telling him to do that Donald Trump will do. All it does is commit signatories to trying to limit the rise in global temperatures to well below two degrees Celsius. It's not even binding, but it does mean that restrictions on uh, industries that burn large amounts of carbon dioxide, such as coal-fired power stations, were put in place. Um, it's nonsensical to suggest that America is uh, going to be losing out as a result in the long term of making free energy more popular, renewable energy. Uh, not free, of course, you've got to buy your turbines, you've got to buy your mills. But it, it, in the long term interests of a country, the less you pay for your energy, the better those long term interests are served. Donald Trump's gone in precisely the opposite direction. Even if he could raise a few quid, and he'll probably call time on the three billion bucks that the Americans were supposed to be spending on helping other countries do this. So he'll save that in the short term, but <laughs> in the long term, hey, the, the, the best case scenario is that nothing much will change, but we'll be paying, Americans will be paying loads more for, for energy than they need to. And the worst case, of course, is that they won't be able to breathe. So why do people buy into this? What's the payoff 
for rejecting science and believing because it's not even a comforting lie it's a comfort oddly with immigration it's a comforting lie you, you things haven't worked out for you as well as you were hoping you don't actually know any proper immigrants or the ones you do know are great you love them you don't mean them but the daily mail immigrant the, the, the kind of identikit immigrant the one with 17 houses 47 children and and eight wives he's the reason why you haven't got a promotion at work or he's the reason why you, you had to retire early i get that that's a comforting lie it's not just bad luck. It's certainly not a result of any failings of my own. It's certainly not the uh, direct upshot of votes that I've cast in the past that my life has gone this way or my country has gone in this way. It's all the fault of Johnny Foreigner coming over here, nicking our jobs, claiming our benefits and, uh, and pulling our women. That's a comforting lie. So I get that. Where is the comfort in climate change denial? Who does it comfort? How does it comfort? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Ed's in Plymouth. Ed, what have you got? Hi, Dan. Thanks for taking my call. You're very welcome. Um, um, I think it's probably maybe oversimplifying it, but I think it's about fear, and I think you're actually wrong, and it is a comforting lie, because it's far easier to believe the nice man in the orange wig than <laughs> believe that the planet could actually kill us all, because that's what we're Oh, to. God, yeah. Of and course. Of course. At, so so I say there's a cliff. I say there's a yeah. cliff. You're heading towards it. You're not quite sure you can get off the bike. Someone else says, don't worry, it's not a cliff. It's a beautiful ramp. You're tempted to believe them. Exactly. It's, you use the example of Galileo and Darwin. Under Galileo, people were afraid that the church was not all-powerful and all-knowing. Of course. So that's why the congregation supported. And again, under Darwin, it was this thing that, well, we're not a perfect species. We're not the pinnacle of evolution or anything like that. We, we, we weren't made out of clay by God, very simply. Yeah. And like you've been accused of obviously all the fear mongering and project fear in, in the past, and it's exactly that. People are like, oh yes, you're, you're just using fear and they don't want to admit they are afraid, so they t allow themselves to believe the comforting lies. And the comforting lie is not that sinister in, when you cast it like that. I mean, it might involve it might involve the early end of our of our species, so it's sinister in one sense, but in the other sense, it, 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 it it's it's not scapegoating. It's just saying I'd rather believe that. But, and also people don't like change so if you factor that in as well yeah. you've got i much prefer this analysis of the world even though the scientists completely reject it because it makes me feel safer and b also why the hell should i change my habits why should i give up this or give up that or buy this or buy that and and certainly i don't want to be taxed on stuff so it works it's just it's just tempting yeah yeah indeed i'm glad you didn't ring at the top of the hour <laughs> i think i was i think i was on towards the towards the start, but I think I was on hold for quite a while. Well, that's the way it works, Ed. I, I like to give people a proper... a proper, It is quite comfort, so yeah, that's it, isn't it? So, you know, here's something awful that's going to happen. And then someone pops up on Fox News and says, no, it isn't. And everyone goes, yeah, great. Oddly, it's the same people who stand up and say that something awful is going to happen when they're talking about other stuff. So the comfort... Because, oddly, again, why, why would Islamophobia, or Muslimophobia, as we must call it, uh, why would Muslimophobia, or, or the kind of pundits that make a living out of slagging off all Muslims, why would they almost always also be climate change denier? What's the crossover there? Because on one side, they're offering the comfort of denying the truth. And on the other side, they're offering something that is not true and is profoundly discomforting. These are the questions with which we wrestle. Um, a slightly simpler question to answer is one that Theo Usherwood, our political editor, is about to address. Unexpected development. I, well, actually, possibly expected, but probably not expected today. The Crown Prosecution Service, James, has decided to charge Craig McKinley, who is the candidate for the Conservative Party uh, down in uh, South Thanet, uh, under the representation of the People's Act 1983 in connection with uh, Tory election expenses during the previous general election back in uh, 2015. Mr McKinley is standing uh, this time round, of course, during the last battle context to this briefly is that the Tories were facing uh, a real battle for South Thanet against Nigel Farage from UKIP. They were keen to make sure that Mr Farage didn't make it into Parliament and so the allegations facing Mr McKinley was that he ramped up the amount of spending uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the constituency and then called it national spending rather than constituency spending because of course constituency spending there's a, there's a limit of around what depends uh, on the size of the constituency between 14,000 and 16,000 pounds and the allegation is that that, ex that, that spending far uh, exceeded uh, that amount. The Conservatives have just released a statement they are standing by uh, Mr McKinley describing the allegations as unfounded and just to give listeners a bit of context to this there were allegations against a number of other people relating to other constituencies uh, and a 
battle bus tour that took mm. place from the Conservatives during the last election and uh, the CPS last month decided not to bring charges in any of those cases. Do, do, do we know why? See, I do know why, but I'm a little legally uncomfortable in... Am I allowed to say so on air? Let's very, very cautiously say that the, the, the figures involved were quite different. And how far up the ladder does this go, potentially? I know that we're both very conscious of the rules that govern us during election time, but it's unlikely that Craig McKinley and the Conservative Party have expressed great confidence that these charges will, will not be found um, to, to have any merit in them. But would he have been acting entirely independently? Would he have access to these sort of funds with, with, without higher sanction? Um, I can't answer that question. It will be down to uh, a court of law to, uh, and, and a jury in a court of law uh, to uh, decide that um, and to look at all of the evidence uh, put before them uh, in the CPS statement, in the Tory party statement. Uh, they like to re they've reminded everybody that uh, commenting on this would be uh, sub judice. So I'm just laying out the facts. Interestingly, let's just moving on to uh, another topic. Uh, you're talking about Donald Trump. Uh, this morning, Jeremy Corbyn uh, has also been speaking and he's been highlighting the fact that Theresa May didn't sign a letter which was signed by France, Germany and Italy condemning Mr Trump. Uh, and of course, uh, Theresa May and Downing Street have only just said that she's disappointed with the decision. Uh, this is what uh, Mr Corbyn has told an audience in York this morning. The commitments made in Paris, and I was there, are vital to stop the world reaching the point of no return on climate change. There can be no question of watering those commitments down. The Paris deal should not ever be up for renegotiation, only for strengthening of it in the future. The Downing Street statement very quickly, the Prime Minister expressed her disappointment with the decision and stressed that the UK remained committed to the Paris Agreement as she set out recently at the G7. Why context to this politically, and this is the point that Labour is trying to ramp up on this, is that somehow uh, Theresa May, by failing to sign uh, this letter alongside France, Germany and Italy, is uh, is is taking... Is, is, the relationship isn't an equal yeah, could, one. Could we be reading too much into that? Perhaps she was too busy thinking about Brexit, which is the reason she gave for not attending that debate the other night. There is an election on, James, yes. Yeah. And she's very busy. OK. Theo, yeah, well, many thanks indeed. Are we going to see you again before one o'clock? I'm sure I'll bring you all the news as it happens. <laughs> Look at that, it's almost a catchphrase. Theo, yeah, well, that's LBC's hard-working political editor with a, with a very seriously sprained ankle, hobbles out of the studio, but will no doubt be hobbling back in again at some point uh, subsequently, uh, whether it's on this programme or the next one. Only time will tell. Do you know what I want to talk about next? I enjoyed that conversation. We'll return to it. You've got to find the right way into it. And I, and I apologise for alienating all of my listeners who enjoy believing lies and enjoy punching themselves in the face and voting against their own interests. But uh, there'll be plenty of room for you to contribute to other topics. When we're trying to work out why anybody would be so dumb, I guess you just don't have much room at the table. But...